Then I look at the camera. There's bubbles. She might be texting me to tell me we're live. Sam? Sam? Okay, there it is. We're live. It's a weird, Sam and I need a better system um, because, there, you know, there's a little, there's a little lag in this stuff. So she just texted me that we're live. So here we are, live. Welcome to the uh, April Live Part Uno because a week, or no, two weeks from today, we're going to do Part Dos. Uh, we're going to do two lives in April. And um, on that note, we're also doing more Facebook Lives. So um, earlier today, I was on Facebook Live on the WWGOA Facebook page. And what I did there was uh, showed you how to take scrap from your scrap bin and turn it into these cool coasters, like little tiny end grain cutting boards. So if you're interested in learning how to do that, go to the WWGOA Facebook page. Um, one of the things, um, well, a couple things. Let me get back into my laptop here. I just went to sleep. There we go. Um, as always, thanks to Titebond for underwriting this and keeping it free for you folks. If you're on YouTube, as I always say, um, I flit back and forth a little bit between YouTube and WWGOA.com. But in all honesty, I am primarily at WWGOA.com. So if you have a pregunta, if you have a question, and you really want to make sure I see it, you're better off if you list it on the WWGOA chat roll. Now that's important too. When you're on, when you're posting a question and you're looking at your screen, there's a blue box that says WWGOA Live. Do not put your question in the discussion. I don't see those. Put your question, it's called a chat roll. Put your question, not a fat roll, not one of these. It's a chat roll. <laughs> put it in the chat roll. Um, the other general announcement is that, let me look and see donde es. Um, right above the chat roll, it says, free projects, sign up to receive, da 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 da, -da. So um, you've, you've probably already seen some of her videos. Jess Crow put together a package of resin, epoxy-related projects. There are five of them free. And um, in order to receive those projects, you can click on that link to sign up. So right above the chat roll, click on that link. You can sign up to get involved in that. It only just started. So there's still plenty of time to get involved with that. Um, so get yourself involved with that, all right? So tight bond, YouTube, resin, go. Here we are. All right, folks, let's jump in. I feel like we had uh, we had more people watching at the last live than we have ever had. Um, so we'll see if that happens again tonight. It's very cool stuff. Uh, Michael asks, good evening, George. My question is about setting fence position on the router table for a joinery bit, like a lock miter. After the initial rough setup, when sneaking up the fence position, do both ends of the fence have to move parallel to each other or can one side be moved to fine tune the setting? Also, does it matter which side is moved in relation to the bit in feed or out feed? Lastly, does direction toward or away from the bit affect which side is moved? So it's like a bunch of no, no, and no. So one of the things, unlike a table saw, which I'm pointing to that you can't see, unlike a table saw, when you put a fence on a router table, it can be skewed across the table. The qualifier to that is if you're not using the miter gauge slot, which for a lock miter, you're typically not. So um, when you go to fine tune your settings, I find it way easier to leave one end of the router table fence locked and I'm moving the other end. And that couple degrees or just a degree of movement gives you a really small change, um, the relationship between the bit and the fence. And that's, especially on a lock miter, that's the kind of really finite change you need. So no, definitely um, lock down one end, pivot the other end. It doesn't matter which end. Whichever one you're just, I don't know, is easiest for you to reach is good. Um, Kevin says, I'm setting up my shop in my attached garage. 
I'm using casters to keep most major tools and main workbench mobile and storable. Should I be concerned about the garage floor's pitch slope to the outside, making my table saw and outfeed table not level when working on projects? Well, things don't need to be level necessarily, but they need to be aligned. So I definitely wouldn't want your outfeed table skewed relative to the table saw, because that could be, you know, where if the table saw table is here, and then the outfeed table is canted because of um, because the floor being having a slope to it, um, that would be bad. But um, you know, if, if I'm building on this table and the whole table is a little bit out of level, I can still build a square project on a non-level table because, as a rule, we're not assembling cabinets or furniture using levels to check them. We're using squares to check them or measuring diagonals. So the, the surface I'm building on doesn't have to be dead level. Dave says, I've been trying to resaw a three quarter inch cherry with my bandsaw. I've watched your class. Thank you. And I think I've done everything correct. Set up to the, to the, to the, the cuts are not working out. Example, I can keep the top fairly aligned in the center, but the bottom of the blade wanders to the right away from the jig. And within five inches, the blade exits the material on the bottom while still aligned on the top. What causes this? So Dave, I'm going to say if all your setup is G to G, if all your setup is good to go, typically if the blade won't maintain a straight line top to bottom, it's one of two things. Either the blade is dull and so you're, when, you, when you're pushing, when you're cutting, you're kind of forcing it because the blade is dull. Um, or if the blade is brand new sharp, um, then um, it's because the blade doesn't have enough tension on it. And um, the other thing, I'll call this a barrel cut. You know, if it, if it enters at the top, if, if you can cut a short piece and then examine it, if it enters at the top, but then the cut has got any kind of a bow in it, which kind of sounds like, that's sort of what's happening here. Often that's because the blade doesn't have enough tension. Then the other thing could be, let's see, it's cutting okay at the top. So the other thing to watch out for with bandsaw blades, it's like with a chainsaw, if you've ever had this happen. Um, if, you, if, if the teeth on the bandsaw blade hit something, like the housing of the bandsaw, only on one side, and you dull all the teeth that point to the right, the teeth to the left still cut okay, but the teeth to the right are dull, and it's impossible to cut a straight line. I don't think what you're describing is a symptom of that. I'm going to say dull blade or um, tension deficit. Charles asked if you had any experience with Western Australian hardwoods, such as mulga. No, but what a cool name for a wood. Um, I have used Jara, which I think was it was either Australian or New Zealand Indian. Um, I don't remember which, but other than that, well, in eucalyptus, um, and I think the the gum wood I used, the eucalyptus I used, I think came from Australia, but that's about it for me. I have a one and three quarter poplar board. 11 inches wide. It's been air dried in a garage for two years. I bought it a month ago. I've let it stabilize since. One piece that I cut for part of the top has some small checking in it that appears to extend a 16th to an eighth inch deep. Seems to stop as it reaches the top of a growth band. Would it be safe to use this for a tabletop or should I use another piece? Well, if, it, if it's got checking in it, I guess I wouldn't use it. I mean, if it if it's already starting to check, so it's air dried for two years. So, you know, as a rule, air drying is a st pretty safe bet. Like it's mechanically so easy to do, but even air drying can happen too fast. Um, inch and three quarter, that's pretty thick. So um, what can happen with any wood, even air dried wood, is it gets what's called case hardening, which is the outside of the wood dried at a different rate than the core. 
In the case of air drying, it could be um, it was in too warm a place, the sun shined on it, something got it to dry a little bit too fast. Um, it sounds a little iffy to me to use it for a tabletop if it's already starting to check on you. I'm just completing an extension to my garage shop. The new section will have a plywood floor. Brr. What do you recommend as the final floor to facilitate easy cleanup? So my old shop, if you look at old videos, I don't know if we ever showed the floor, um, but anything that we shot more than eight years ago was in my old shop. I built that building and it was a floor joist floor. This is a concrete floor. And I had three quarter inch plywood was my finished floor. Um, and it, it swept pretty easy. Um, I always, um, in, in, my, in my illusions for that shop, I always wanted to put in a hardwood floor. I thought it would be cool. Um, and, and I never finished the plywood. It was just raw plywood. Um, so I thought, well, it'd be neat. It would look neat to have a hardwood floor. It'd be cool to have a floor with a sealer on it so it would sweep a little bit easier. But in all honesty, um, I used that shop from 98 until like 20... 12 um, and the floor swept up just fine so um, plywood alone would be a good surface you could paint the plywood that would give it a little bit more um, ease of cleaning because it would be a smoother surface um, and then other than that you know like stuff you'd put in a if you're moving tools around most floor items floor things that you put in a kitchen or a house probably aren't going to have the durability you want to be rolling casters under 400 pound saws over. So um, I like the idea of sticking with plywood or um, see if you can scrounge up a deal on, on hardwood flooring. That would be pretty cool. David is in Portland, Oregon. Cleston, a uh, longtime watcher, is in uh, Houston. And uh, AJ is watching from Boston. Uh, AJ just got his hair cut by his granddaughter the other day, um, which doesn't sound like much of a deal, except his granddaughter, what is she now, like five, AJ, crazy? So um, it, was a, it was a very creative hairstyling that got done on AJ there. John says, I'm setting up my shop in my retirement. Good for you. I'm getting ready to build a vanity with flared curved legs. I have a stock 14 inch bandsaw with a riser block and stock guides. Should I invest in a set of Carter bearing guides now and start getting use of them? Or do you think they're unnecessary if you set this up properly? Um, I had a Delta bandsaw 14 inch with a riser block on it forever. Um, bought it in 93. It came to this shop with me. Um, so that was in 2012. Um, and I always, I had cool blocks on it. I changed the steel blocks to cool blocks um, and I never went to bearings and it worked just fine. Part of the reason for me was I, I did a fair bit of resawing on that saw, which is where bearings really help pay off. Um, but I also did a fair bit of scrolling on that saw. So honestly, I used everything from um, an eighth inch blade to a three quarter inch blade on that saw. And I found for the narrower blades, the phenolic blocks, cool blocks, were easier um, to set up and work just fine for those narrower blades. So um, if you're going to prevail toward doing lots and lots of resawing, I think going to the Carter bearings is a great way to go. If you're uh, more of a general purpose, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, I think sticking with cool blocks is fine. Um, now, Sam our behind the scenes guru and Wizard of Oz has put a comment up that's got a link to the resin, wanna work with resin pit. Um, so if you're not finding it on the page above the chat roll, um, there's a link there you can click on as well. Um, Sean is asking, about his first hand plane. I'm sorry, I'm not the guy for that. I know so little about hand tools. Bill is in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Brandon, Florida, Missouri, Pennsylvania, Australia. 
Um, here's a question. What do you use as a block sander? I'll show you my favorite. Let me run and get it. That's a great question. And I love this product. I'm not gone. I'm not really gone. I'm a little gone. But I'm coming back. Here I come. All right. The question was, what do you use as a block sander? This is my fave. The brand is Time Shaver, not Saver, Shaver, Time Shaver. It uses a quarter sheet. So when you manipulate these bales, that's what makes that end move. Um, really a, a great sander. I think I own four or five of them because I'm prone to loading, you know, whatever. There's 80 grit on one, 120 on one. Um, whatever, progressing up, and I just leave that paper on and I change blocks. Very cool sanding block. Yeah, the people are commenting about the rubber hand blocks shaped in an arc with the metal spikes. Boy, do I remember loading those babies with sandpaper in like junior high, um, and everybody's right. It's that it, getting the sandpaper to tension over those spikes is crazy hard. This one, um, if you, you pull it tight as you're loading it and then throw the bale and it'll kinda, it kind of draws it in so the paper is really snug on there. It's a cool product. Uh, Clint says it's in Louisiana. Best way to remove pencil layout lines on bare wood. Have tried denatured alcohol with no luck. Well, there goes my answer. I was going to use, I was going to say um, denatured alcohol. In the absence of alcohol, I would sand them off. Um, it's a bad idea to erase them because sometimes the eraser leaves a residue on the surface. And if that, and then that's a spot that won't take finish. So, yeah, if, if um, alcohol is not cleaning them off, then I would sand them. Richard asks, is teak okay for an end grain, edge grain, edge grain or end grain? Um, cutting board, I've read that it can be tough on a knife, but they also look fairly popular versus poplar. Are you making a play on words? Um, so the deal with teak is it's got silica in it, silica being an ingredient of sand and glass. Um, so if you work with teak in your shop, pointing to my table saw, you know, up against your woodworking tools, it is pretty abrasive, even on carbide. So theoretically then, apply that to a cutting board. Is it going to be harder than oak, maple, walnut, cherry on a cutting edge? Probably, but I feel too like if you're, if, if, if you're what you're talking about is an end grain cutting board, we are going to incorporate a bunch of different woods. I don't know. Even if the whole thing was teak, I feel like, you know, you slice through the tomato and your contact with that wood is so incidental that I don't, I don't think that's going to be a deal breaker for a cutting board. Larry asks, every time I use a round over bit, I get a ridge on the top of the cut. Why? Why, why, why? Well, Larry, it's most likely because, so I use round overs bits, so I use round over bits so much. One lives in this router, which isn't that a cool router? It's a Rockwell, 15 bucks at a thrift store, runs like a champ. Um, so anyway, my roundover bit just lives in there. So when you set this up, I'm just going to walk in. That's easier than moving the camera. Router's unplugged, of course. So when you set this up, we need the square portion, that corner right there of the roundover to be perfectly even with the base of the router. And if the router bit projects out just a tiny bit too far, then that corner is going to start to cut into your work and it sounds like that's what's happening to you. So you've got to shallow up the depth of your bit just a little bit. And of course, if it's 
In the perfect world, you have it perfectly even. If the bit is a little too shallow, if it's not quite deep enough, you don't get a complete round over. So you just got to keep messing with test cuts until you hit the balance between too deep and too shallow. Ryan says, hello from Myrtle Beach. Getting into scroll work, are spiral blades the way to go? Seem to be a lot of opinions. Well, so my first qualifier, Ryan, is I own a scroll saw. My kids have probably used it more than I. Um, so I, I know enough to be dangerous. Now, the spiral blades to me make sense. Um, if you're not familiar with them, spiral blades for a scroll saw have teeth all the way around. So you can... Um, cut and then if you need to turn a corner you can just move sideways move back move sideways rather than constantly turning the board what the downside is to that i don't know maybe it's a cut quality thing because you don't have as many teeth in contact with the cut as you would with a conventional blade um, that being said i've used a scroll saw enough to know that when the right blade is in there it's pretty amazing you can be just about standing in one spot and make a 90 degree turn and move. So what's the real necessity of having a spiral blade? You know, it's more about learning to use the scroll saw and learning to make the turns right. So um, I'm not your best resource on this because I just don't have enough hours on a, on a scroll saw. Robert says, recently cut my fingers on a bandsaw. I am so sorry, it sounds bad. I have a new appreciation for safety precautions. Is there a pair of gloves you recommend for woodworking? You know, my recommendation is you don't wear gloves when you're woodworking. Um, I think you're just, uh, if you put a pair of gloves on, you're increasing the likelihood that you're going to catch a glove in something and get your hand pulled into a tool. So um, I understand what you're saying, um, but it's... Um, I've seen people wear gloves when they're turning on the lathe. I don't do it. Um, my one exception to that, if you saw the video, is when I turned the bullet bowl. Um, it was a, a resin casting filled with cartridges, with bullet casings. The brass was coming off so hot I had to put a glove on um, so I didn't get my hand burned. Um, but general woodworking, I, I do not recommend you wear gloves when you're working in the shed. Uh, AJ says, watch out for Mulga. Wood database gives uh, t these toxicity notes. Irritant, headache, nausea, lesions. The wood contains a virulent poisonous principle used for spearheads by aboriginals. What an interesting background that is. Thanks for the info there, AJ. That's interesting. Joe asks, uh, how high a grid of sandpaper? Do you need a sand epoxy to remove scratches and go back to having the epoxy clear? So I've, the last thing, and this was a bowl on the lathe, um, I sanded it, I wet sanded it to 400, and then I polished it with Total Boats polishing compound. Um, and it was, that was the bullet bowl. Um, and it was as clear as a piece of glass when I was done. So wet sanded to 400, um, wet sanded to 400 and then polished it with polishing compound. And AJ corrects me, Grace is four years old. So think about a four year old cutting your hair. And AJ has very stylish hair. So there was a lot at risk there. Um, Harry says, I dropped out as you were talking about the plywood floor. What about your current concrete floor? Is it sealed to help with sweeping? So I'm, I'm very lucky well, you can kind of see it in the camera. I was going to point the camera down. There's my floor. Um, this was a commercial building. Um, it started out as a post office. Then it was a retail store. Then uh, a stained glass guy was in here for a while. But it's actually got asphalt tile, wall to wall, end to end. So it sweeps very easy. It's not sealed concrete. Um, I know when we did April shop, um, she's on a concrete slab there. Uh, she did not seal the concrete, and she's not, you know, she just sweeps. It's not difficult for her to keep that floor clean. Uh, Rosewood, what should my 
Speed B for my lathe seems to be tough to gouge out the center. It's not, so it's not about the wood, it's about the size of the thing you're turning. So um, I'll look later to see if I can find them, but you really wanna, we have on the site on WWGOA, a spindle turning speed chart and a bowl turning speed chart. And it's on bowls, it's the thickness of the stock and the diameter of the stock. And then on spindles, it is the diameter. Um, bigger they are, the slower you go. Um, and I've turned rosewood and it turns, I've had great success with it. So make sure your chisels are sharp and then um, go from there. Gary's in California, enjoys the live shows. Thanks for watching or we wouldn't do them. So William asks about glue creep on cutting board glue ups after first complete sanding smooth it appears after finishing suggestions to prevent. You know, this is, I've, I've heard and read about glue creep. I've never experienced it. Um, let me, uh, let me, let me grab a cutting board. Coming back. Coming back. I did a couple of these, I don't know, a month ago. End grain. Um, sanded them to 220, 220, 221, whatever it takes. Um, sanded them to 220, finished them, and they're mirror smooth. So, like I said, that's something I have read about but I myself haven't had to deal with, so I don't, I got nothing, sorry. Rodney says, I just inlaid some thin bloodwood strips between a plywood coffee table top and a pine frame. I'm a newbie, there are some tiny cracks and gaps between the bloodwood and the other surfaces. Should I fill that with something or just let the shellac fill them? Um, I don't, I mean, if it's a crack, shellac is going to go in there but it's not going to fill it i'll tell you what my favorite thing is for filling small voids i'm looking for i wish i had um i'm thinking a second i wish i had something that had just a tiny little hairline crack in it um so i could show you um use yellow glue standard yellow glue and put a little bit of yellow glue into that void. And then with your finger or something, wipe the excess off the surface. And while the glue is still wet, hand sand, take a sanding block, and it could be 180, 220 grit paper in there, and hand sand right over that wet glue. And what happens is that your, the sawdust you're making mixes with the wet glue and makes a nearly invisible putty in there. Now, this works when we're talking about hairline cracks this works really 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 well if you're talking about big voids you're never gonna get enough you know you got to go to a wood dough for that but if they're pretty small um, try that trick of yellow glue hand sanding and it's um it has saved my bacon a bunch of this made me look like a way better woodworker than i really am Uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading questions. What happened to your beard? <laughs> well, let's see. I shaved it off like a decade ago, I think. I don't know. AJ probably, maybe AJ remembers better than I do. Um, my beard came off a long time ago, my mustache came off the summer I did the backpacking trip in New Mexico, which was 2017. So yeah, my, my face has been completely naked for three years and uh, the beard has been off for a really long time. Uh, Gary says, what can I use to restore my table on my table saw? It has rust and is very old, smooth, but not great. So yeah, it's, it's pretty simple stuff. Um, elbow grease, um, spray it with WD-40. Well, and I'm going to talk about a product. Let me go get it, but I'll start with this. WD-40, 
Scotch-Brite pad or a sanding block that's got 220 grit wet dry sandpaper on it. And then just you're basically going to wet sand the table saw until the rust is off. And then once the rust is done, you'll have to go back and clean it, use mineral spirits or something like that. But let me go and grab, I want to grab two things for show and tell. So this is the, the downside of not having a camera person is I'm have to leave the camera. Um, shoot, I'm still looking. Because I want to, I'm dying to try this stuff. So maybe this is, I just got it. And I'm going to really put it to a test. I'm going to try to clean these vice grips. See how rusty those are? So the product is Metal Rescue. So don't, I haven't tried it yet. Um, well, it's saying soak the item. I don't know. Look into it. Maybe this is a solution too for cast iron. Then, once it's clean, this is my fave, Bostic Glide Coat. So everything in this place, lathe beds, table saw table, router bases, dovetail template, joiner bed, bandsaw table, everything gets a shot of Bostic Glide Coat on it. Um, spray it on, let it dry, just read the directions, buff it out. That'll help prevent rust from reforming. It also makes their stuff slide way more better. All right, a couple things. Um, I mentioned when we started, I'm going to mention it again now. We are just starting a, a introduction to working with resin thing, and it's Jess Crow that's doing it. If you've not seen her work, you're missing out. She does amazing, really artistic stuff with resin, way more than uh, you know, just pouring resin into a mold of some kind and being done. Um, very, very artistic with that as a medium. So um, on the WWGOA page, right above the chat roll where we're talking right now, there's a link you can click, and she has created five projects, and you can get involved with that. She's done tutorials on it, and then I believe there are also going to be some live streams where she can answer your questions. So um, it's a really cool thing and a great opportunity to learn about working with epoxy from somebody who's really, really, really good at it and have been doing it for a long time. Um, all right, back to questions. John says, Thompson, North Dakota, love your content. Thank you. I inherited my dad's router table and it's not very good. Trying to figure out whether to make my own or purchase one. I'm relatively new to the hobby. If purchase, what's the difference in the tops? Thanks in advance. Um, I've every router table. I got to think a second, but I'm pretty sure this is accurate. Every router table I've ever ever owned has been phenolic. That's not to say there's anything wrong with the MDF tables. I know there are a lot of them out there. Um, I don't know, you know, theoretically, I guess phenolic is. If phenolic's not going to absorb ambient humidity, is phenolic going to stay flatter over time than MDF? Maybe, um, but still, um, when you're talking about a thick piece of MDF that's been laminated, plastic laminate typically, top and bottom, and has usually a, a T-molding around the edge, you've got that MDF pretty well sealed. So I don't think an MDF top is inherently a bad thing. Um, I think, yes, the phenolic, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my phenolic table. The phenolic is incapable of soaking up humidity because it just can't. Um, but that's, like I said, that's not to necessarily say that MDF is going to be a bad thing. Kevin is in upstate New York. I was in East Durham, New York last October, and I'm going to be there again this October. What a, what a beautiful spot, uh, beautiful part of the country. Flew into Albany. And then drove from there. I did a really long motorcycle trip while I was there. What I had no idea. What a beautiful part of the country. Um, 
Do you have a solution for running long boards on a joiner with a short in-feed and out-feed table? Uh, um, as a general rule with jointers, the rule is whatever the length of your jointer bed is, you can go twice as long as that with the board you're jointing. So <clears throat> if you've got a really short, you know, some of these bench top six inch joiners might only be this long. Um, I used to have one, I had one at my old shop. Um, you can try doing stuff with in feed and out feed rollers, you know, roller stands, but they've got to be set so that the roller stand is perfectly even with the bed of the jointer. So that means you're going to set the height of the infeed table, the, how much cut you're taking, and then set that roller to that height. And then the other roller is going to be different, set to the outfeed table. And they have to be dead on because if you start to sag off as you go through, then you're not going to get the benefit of the jointer. So um, at the end of the day, um, maybe other people have other workarounds. But as far as I know, um, it's just a limitation of a short jointer is they're good for short boards. I watched the uh, Niles, Michigan. I watched the video for the birdhouse the other day. Thought it'd be fun to do with my grandson. Are there plans to go with it? Or do I just need pen and paper and handy? I think, is it the one my kid is in, George Jr.? Like 11 billion years ago. He's now 21 years old and in the Marine Corps and in college. And um, he was like this big in the video. Um, so yeah, it's just, I think all of the dimensions are just given verbally on the video. Donald is in New Orleans, Albert's in Merrimack, Massachusetts. Any experience with air drying fresh milled lumber? Um, what recommendations could you give for stacking and preventing end crack? So Albert, we have a video on air drying lumber and I brought a guy in it, Greg. I brought a guy in for it, Greg. And um, it's, a, it's a bunch of elm that I cut on my sawmill. Um, we sticker it, we stack it. He talks about that whole process airflow, the whole thing. So that would be your best bet is um, right at the top of the WWGOA page where it says, um, what can I help you with, right? Yep. So in that, just type in air drying lumber and that'll get you to that video. All right. So Bill in Duluth says, when running with my planer, I get a gouge or scoop about four inches at both ends. Any suggestions? Yeah, so that's called snipe. Um, and what happens, especially if it's a bench top planer, the planer head rocks just a little bit. When you get under the infeed roller, it rocks down a little bit, and then you overcut. And as soon as it gets to the outfeed roller, the planer head levels out. And then as it comes through and it fall and it's out from under the infeed roller, the planer head cocks down again and you get an overcut at the end. So um, on large stationary planers, you can overcome snipe typically by adjusting the tension on the infeed and outfeed rollers. On benchtop planers, that's why most benchtop planers have planer head locks on them or newer benchtop planers, um, because then what you're, you're literally locking the cutter head in place so I can't do that dance as your board is going through. Um, if you don't have a cutter head lock, um, you can feed a short piece of scrap, then your real board, then a short piece of scrap, and you'll snipe the scrap boards. You won't snipe your target board. Um, what kind of motorcycle do I ride? I currently have a Yamaha Royal Star Venture. I'm going to sell it this spring, like as soon as the whole, um, I, I'd have a for sale sign on it now, except everything is so kerflui. Um, and I, I'm going to look for something in the same size. That's a 1500. Um, I'm going to look for about the same size bike, but um, the Royal Star is nice, you know, when you're cruising. But it's a great cruiser. I, I go up into the National Forest a lot. And that is not a great bike for just putting on the gravel uh, fire roads in the National Forest 
in northern Wisconsin. So I'm going to do another 15 or 1700 cc bike, but in a different style um, that lends itself better to that kind of riding that I do. Dennis is in Blossom, Texas. What a cool name for a town. Republic, Michigan. Um, I can use a jig, but having a very difficult time cutting dovetails by hand. Any advice? Uh, you know, standing on the corner in New York, how do I get to... Uh, oh, shoot. I'm, I'm going to screw up the joke because I can't remember the name of the auditorium. Is it Carnegie Hall? How, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer is practice, practice, practice. You know, um, Hand cut dovetails, I did them when I was teaching with the Peace Corps in Africa, and holy buckets did I spend time practicing in the shop with a kerosene light. We didn't have electricity night after night after night. There's just, there's a lot of mechanics to it, a lot of um, mechanical repeatability you got to teach your body to do. And I would just, you know, um, Annie Briggs, Anne of All Trades, um, she's really good with hand tools, look up her stuff. Um, watch tutorials that are showing you those body mechanics and really pay attention to that because that's a really big part of being able to cut accurately. Gordon asks, setting up my workshop, what should I look for in a table saw? Uh, break. I, when people ask me on table saw advice, I always say, save your pennies, buy a saw stop. Um, I know they're, um, they're more expensive than other saws, but they have a break, which could save your finger or your hand or somebody else's finger or somebody else's hand. So it's um, saw stops are really good saws that also have a break. So do a saw stop. Can I mix end grain with non for cutting boards? Oh, that's interesting. So like in a board, so this is end, this is all end grain. So could you could this be like long grain then an end grain? I think so, because what I'm thinking through here is seasonal movement. Yeah, so I think you could have if you had one if you had a board that was long grain and then one that was end grain in this direction across their thickness or width, they still should move the same. So yeah, I think you would, I think you would still be okay there. Ken says, I just finished two bowls and used friction polish. After polishing, there are tiny scratch marks on them. Running my fingernail across the scratches, I cannot detect a scratch. One of the bowls has five coats, but the scratches remain. Did I not sand enough? Wood is hard maple. Yeah, it kind of sounds to me like maybe it's in, you're seeing something in the wood. So, um, yeah, it sounds, especially in hard maple, um, a scratch in, in that can really show up and be hard to get out. Um, so you just make sure as you're progressing through your grits, you spend enough time at each level um, 120 grit gets out the chisel marks, 150 grit gets out the 120 marks, all the way up until all the sanding marks are out. Joe asks, do you have a go-to finish for small turning projects? I do. I have two. Um, one I think I'm out of, but the other one I'll show you. Coming back, I haven't abandoned you. The one that I buy is called Mylands Turner's Finish, M-Y-L-A-N-D-S. Um, and as Ken just mentioned, it's a friction polish, polishes up really, really nice. The one I make is this. Um, this is one third boiled linseed oil, one-third de-wax shellac, doesn't have to be de-waxed, one-third shellac, one-third mineral spirits. So on this mustard jar, that's why these lines are on here, is I measured the height of the jar, that's a third of it and a third of it and a third of it. 
So when it's empty and I go to fill it, I can pour boiled linseed oil, mineral spirits, shellac, and then I intentionally left it. See how it settles out? So then when you're going to use this, shake it up, baby, now. And then brr, put that on. And it does, um, the Mylans I mentioned comes up to a higher polish than this does, but this I can make in my shop. So I don't get the gloss out of this. I do out of the friction polish, um, but it does work well. Kevin says he used Metal Rescue on hand plane bodies and it worked well. So that's cool. David asked if he had good results spraying polyurethane. Yeah, pretty good results. So I did, um, I did a bunch of cedar signs for a bed and breakfast. They had walking trails. So I CNC cut a bunch of cedar signs um, that identified the trails. And then I sprayed everything with polyurethane. I thinned it about 10%. I have a turbine based HVLP. I thinned it about 10%, used a 1.3 millimeter tip, light coats. If you put it on heavy, it's going to be like honey um, and it's not going to want to dry. So um, it was lots of light coats, um, but it, it sprayed okay. Frank says, can I use the same compressor I use for pneumatic tools with the pressure pot for resin casting? Are there other requirements? Um, we must keep missing you, Frank, because I've seen this question, I think, about three or four times, and we keep answering it. Um, so the answer is yes, same compressor. The pressure pot I use only calls for 45 pounds of pressure, so it doesn't take much to fill it up. So as long as you can get 45 pounds of pressure out of whatever you got, um, you should be able to top off a pressure pot. Uh, Roy asks, maximum depth of cut on a benchtop joiner? Little. I mean, I, I rarely take more than a 16th off, even on my big Laguna 8-inch joiner. And it's typically set at a 32nd. So um, I always do light swipes, no matter what. Bowling Green, Ohio. Uh, somebody asked, is there snow? So it's not snowing now. It was at lunchtime. It's, uh, if you watch my Instagram stuff, I was whining about snow. Want to sell that recurve bow? Are you crazy? You can never have too many bows. It's like guitars, man. It's, uh, you can never have too many bows, guitars, or I don't know, a few other things. Um, John asks, are you still spending time between woodworking and classic car restoration? So no, um, and that's, some of you might not know this, but so the company that owns Woodworkers Guild, which isn't me, um, I'm just, I'm contract labor to the company that owns Woodworkers Guild and Personal Defense Network and Get Fit You, or so they, they have about 15 things like woodworking. So, a number of years ago when um, everything was kind of just getting rolling and and I don't know, we were probably three or four years into shooting woodworking videos. Um, the same guy that does my woodworking videos came back from a auto repair shoot and they were short on content. He had done the shoot in California and we're in Minneapolis and Wisconsin. So he came back from that shoot and needed about another hour of content and he knew I did a lot of my own car repairs. So he says to the guy, he says, could you provide us about an hour of content on car repair? So I actually partnered up with my friend Brent, who's a way better car repair guy than me and an amazing bodywork guy. Really, really good. So that boiled into, we did, I don't know, a bunch of auto repair tips, which are on the classic car restoration website, YouTube. We did a bunch of DVDs on auto repair. Um, and our take on it was very backyard mechanic, like keep your daily driver on the road. So it wasn't about souping cars up. It was about um, show me how to do a water pump, show me how to change a transmission, show me how to do a clutch. So it was pretty cool. And then I also did a bunch of videos uh, same for the same group. Um, they were going to do a DIY, you know, kind of like a, like a home improvement channel for a while. So I shot a bunch of those. And then they also have an RV 
uh, channel. So I did a bunch of stuff for the RV channel because I camp a lot. So um, I've got videos in all four of the woodworking is the most prevalent, but I've got video in all four of those categories. Uh, dust extraction setup in your shop. So I'm funky. I don't have a central. Well, I've got central collectors. I don't have one central unit. So on that wall, I've got a 110 volt unit um, that's got a six inch pipe on it. And on that wall, same thing, 110 volt unit with a six inch pipe on it. The ones on this side are piped to my jointer and my drum sander, my Supermax. The one on that side is piped to my CNC machines, my bandsaw, my router table. And then I've got a separate little standalone one that is connected only to my table saw. Got to watch the time. All right, 10 minutes. Amanda asks, I watched your recent video on inset drawer faces. How can I go about creating spacers like those using the video and get them to exact thickness for parts so small? Well, this is cool. I'll show you. This is, this is a good demo. Let me find stuff. This, this will be a jig you must build. All right, I want to get you to the table saw. I'll show you the jig. Here is the easiest and a really safe way to make really narrow parts on your table saw. And I'm sure this is how I made those three 30 second spacers. Take a chunk of something, this is MDF, and cut it to a size. Six inches, eight inches, 10 inches, whatever. We want this to be an even number. And then here, there's a little hook that started as probably quarter inch plywood, only glued on, no staples in that. Because over time, you're probably going to cut into it like we're probably about to right now. Then, the way one uses it is, I want to make sure you can see the action here. I want a 330 second spacers for making inset drawer fronts. I set my fence to 10 and 330 seconds. The jig goes against the fence. The material, find a straight edge. I'm going to go grab a different board because this edge is a little kerfluated. This one's mo better. Put that straight edge against the jig, and then everything goes together. All right, and then you can check that. You can move the fence a little if you need to, you know, if it's not quite the right size. But this is, for me, that's how I cut thin parts like this. That's how I make splines. So I just spline that to you. Delbert asks, have you used WD-40 specialist for rust remover? No. Is that a product? Is that a thing? WD-40 specialist? Is that a, I, I haven't heard of it. No, I've used WD-40. Um, recently used water locks on a solid cherry desktop. After curing, there are weird indentations. I've never used water locks, so I don't know where that could have come from. How long should you let wood dry before turning a bowl and which way to cut into the grain? Well, I, I never let it dry. I turn pretty much everything I do green. And you want the grain, for the most part, I hate to say never, but rarely do people turn into end grain on a bowl. You would have the grain going this way and you're hollowing it in this direction. Um, 
So I turn my stuff green start to finish. My friend Paul um, turns it green and the percentage he uses is the wall thickness is 20% of the diameter. He leaves that heavy wall on it. Then he lets that dry in a paper bag. And then after it's dry, he goes back and does the final turning. So I'm getting motorcycle advice. That's cool. BMW GS Adventure. All right, I'll look it up. So, so speaking of motorcycles, completely off topic. Um, oh, shoot. Now I'm going to blank on the TV show name. Um, Ewan McGregor and a friend of his, they started in England, and they rode across Europe through Russia, boated up to Alaska, across Alaska, Canada, United States, ended in New York. What a cool show. And then they did another one where they started in England and they rode to Cape Town all the way through Europe, all the way through Africa. If you're a motorcycle person, um, shoot, somebody will think somebody will know what the show is. It's it was so it was very fun to watch. Very riveting. Jerome is in Thailand. Advantage of an end grain cutting board. Um, end grains harder than long grain. So it'll take wear. It'll take those knife slices better. Indian chieftain rider. I got I like the Indian bikes a lot. There's an Indian dealer just right across the river in Minnesota. Um, they get a lot of do re mi for those. That's the same reason I don't ride a Harley. Is um, price comparatively, um, there's so much more money. Um, do you have any lung problems after all these years of woodworking? Nope. So here's the thing with wood and wood dust, and we got to wrap up in a minute here. Um, allergic reaction is a cumulative thing. So you need to protect yourself at every step along the way. And if your kids or spouse or anybody else is in the shop with you, they need to be protected as well. So today to say, oh, I don't have to worry about it. I'm not allergic to wood dust. That doesn't mean you won't be allergic in 10 years. And imagine if you really fall in love with this hobby and then you can't do it because it's killing you. Um, I'm very lucky. I've, I've always been real. It's same when I was in building construction, you know, and this is at a time when um, it ain't cool to wear a dust mask, but blowing cellulose, cellulose insulation into attics, putting fiberglass insulation into stud pockets, um, cut and treated lumber, I was wearing a mask. Same thing here. I'm very religious about air filtration. In addition to the dust collectors I talked about earlier, I've got standalone air filters that I run. Um, when I'm turning on the lathe, I've got a um, respirator that I wear. So I'm really, really meticulous about it. Uh, Justin says, you usually keep the table saw shield, I guess guard, on. Yes. Um, there are very few cuts for which I can't have the guard on. And uh, so it's it's 98% of the time it's on the saw. And if it's not, um, the saw has got a riving knife. So if for whatever cut I'm making, the um, guard has to be off, the riving knife goes on because that helps prevent kickback. Is that a guitar I see inside the doorway behind you? If so, did you make it? Do you play? So I got to see which guitar. I'm looking to see which one you can see. Yeah, so that one I actually did make. I made it from a kit. It's a funky body style. It's called a Renaissance guitar. I have built um, probably a dozen guitars from kits. Never built one from scratch. Um, US guitar kit has great kits. Um, the one that's hanging in here is a company called Music Makers. Um, so, yeah, I do play. I started in uh, when I built my first guitar in 2016 or so. No, earlier than that. I don't know. A while ago. 2007, I think. Um, I, that's when I learned to play is when I built my first guitar. And, yeah, I love it. Um, spent a lot of time two nights ago playing John Prine songs. And some of you probably know why. Um, yeah, I play whenever I can. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Long way round. 
is the motorcycle show where they go from England to New York. Long way down is the show where they go from England to Cape Town. They're, they're, and the BMW is what got me thinking about that because they're on BMWs for that. Have you ever been to Barker's and Hudson? Numerous times. And I used to have a lot of fixtures in there. I built a lot of stuff for Barker's a long time ago. I mean, so long ago, I don't think any of it's there anymore. Um, their popcorn popper was for a long time on a cabinet that I built. Um, I refinished their tables a time or two. Um, yeah, I've been to Barker's and um, San Pedro's, same owner, right across the street. I built, when they first opened, I built the booths, I built the galvanized bar top, I built the cabinet behind the bar, I built the fish stand cabinet, um, long time ago. All right, eight o'clock, straight up. So, last thing. Um, thanks again to Tightbond for underwriting this so it keeps us free for everybody. And then additionally, again, if you have any interest at all in working with resin, with epoxy, um, on the page on WWGOA where we're watching the live stream as we speak, um, right above the chat gizmo, it says, sign up to receive five days of resin woodworking projects, click here. So that's, again, that's Jess Crow. She's quite the artiste in resin, does really amazing work. And she developed the project. She's providing instruction. She's going to walk you through it. Resin is expensive stuff. That's part of the drive here is um, helping you not waste a bunch of do re mi um, by screwing up inadvertently projects you're trying to make out of resin. So check that out. And then remember, we're doing extra lives. So we did one earlier on Facebook today. Woodworkers Guild's Facebook page. I showed you how to make these coasters from scrap. We're going to be live on Facebook again a week from today, 11 o'clock in the morning. We're going to be live here again two weeks from today um, on the, what day is it? The 9th, right? The 20, I don't know, Sam will correct me. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be, it's either the Wednesday or the Thursday of that week. We're going to be live again. So, all right, I'm going to be done. I will uh, see you when I look at you. Thanks, as always, to Sam for doing such a great job. Hasta la pasta.